All right. Uh, hello, everybody. This is going to be a very different talk from the previous one. <laughs> Most physics and and then on the on the average over the hour, we'll have a good balance, I think. So uh, I'm Hugues Chate. I'm in Paris uh, and sometimes in China, but not anymore these days. And this is work has been done actually in collaboration with uh, some Chinese group, in particular the group of He Peng Zhang. Let me can you see my let me get rid of can you see my pointer yeah i think so yes uh uh Peng Zhang here uh, is let me try to go to this fancy laser pointer okay is a, a professor now in shanghai chao tong university he Li was at the time of this work uh, he's finishing a student and now he's a, still a postdoc there because of covid and Xia Xingxi is uh, one of my main collaborators these days from nearby Suzhou University in China doing uh, the modeling with me. So uh, this will be presenting an experiment done, obviously, on, on living matter. Uh, and we treat this, um, we treat this uh, from a theorist uh, modeling viewpoint. And, and my whole point here will be uh, to convince you that uh, you can build a very simple model uh, incorporating only physical interactions that will account for this space-time dynamics that you see in the background now occurring in very dense suspensions of uh, bacteria okay and before i get to this really um is a slide that is a sort of a personal view on what is now called active matter uh, so active matter if you don't know the term it refers to all systems which uh, spend energy to produce work or motion at the level of individual units at the micro level. Okay, and we're interested myself, I'm interested in the collective properties that emerging that are emerging from this. And ideally, uh, you would go step by step from experiments here. Um, all the way to microscopic, which is like particle-based models. If you have units, you want to model them at some uh, directly, maybe, and then build up continuous theories, which usually involves passing through kinetic theories, and then hydrodynamic theories, which are PDEs for the important slow varying long wavelength fields in the system. And if you do this on this side of a of a path here where you do incorporate fluctuations all the way, you may be able in a final step to do a normalization group studies. So that's like a furious dream. Um, my point here is that uh, what you hear a lot in terms of modeling these space-time complicated active matter systems is a lot of hydrodynamic theories, usually the deterministic version. So coupled PDEs representing you know, the density field, the velocity field things like that, uh, or microscopic models. And the connection to experiments is usually uh, weak, I would say. Uh, so what I want to show you today is that you can actually do at least this first step very uh, convincingly quantitatively, okay? Which is not so often that it happens. All right, so, and for the other steps, uh, well, to be for other talks, but, okay. so. It's about active pneumatics. And I checked a uh, whole series of seminars that have been given here, and you didn't have any on active pneumatics so far, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this has become a very fashionable subtopic of active matter. And what do we mean by that? Uh, usually we have in mind at least elongated particles, which are very, very dense, most of the time in 2D. And when they're dense in 2D, they align. Uh, they have no head or tail or in principle, and uh, they form locally some this alignment gives you a pneumatic director, a pneumatic orientation. So you don't know whether it's, you know, whether here, here you don't know whether it's up and down, but it's clearly aligned. These things are microtubules bundling, bundled together. Okay, so we have an orientation field here in 2D, a pneumatic field uh, that if you have a disorder in your system, in your orientation, that has, is bound to have a so-called topological defects where you see here that the pneumatic orientation goes like this, then like this, then like this, and at this central point, it's actually ill-defined. It's a singularity which is topologically bounded, which means it cannot go away by itself. It needs to meet a singularity of the other type here, plus one half defect when they meet, 
they can annihilate, leaving you a perfect orientation, so locally at least. And when they're created, they're created by pairs. So this is illustrated here on the left on shaken granular metallic particles. It's so-called the dry system where you can neglect the air uh, surrounding the particles and the energy is injected by vertical shaking. And you see a minus one half defect here and a plus one half defect here. So in time, these defects are moving and you'll see some of these later. Um, and that's called pneumatic turbulence or, or some kind of chaos. Uh, that's occurring in these dense systems. Orientational order is defined everywhere. These point defects move, and people have focused a lot on the motion of these defects. And I will do the same and I'll explain to you why I do this later. Okay. Uh, so um, there are many systems. So here you, you saw uh, granular shaken rods. You, I didn't speak about it, but this is a, a, very, a very famous system first uh, built by uh, Zvonimir Dodzik, which consists of at the liquid liquid interface, you have this high density uh, of bundled microtubules and uh, kinesin motors uh, clusters, which actually uh, slide microtubules against each other. These are polar objects, but they're forming this apolar pneumatic. And uh, in the presence of ATP, the whole thing moves as long as ATP doesn't run out in this uh, nice uh, space-time chaos, but again, I will illustrate later. So this is the most famous actin pneumatic system. There are others, acto, actin and myosin has been used as well, various cells, and actually rather few bacterial systems. And so I'll show you one, okay? And most experiments consist in, in actually um, measuring uh, the pneumatic order, uh, the defects, uh, the experiments are getting more and more complicated these days. You have 3D active pneumatics, which of course is experimentally a challenge for visualization. Uh, influence from confinement, uh, of chirality, various other things. It's, it's branching out to, to, to more and more complicated uh, systems, okay? Uh, and the modeling, so it's basically in terms directly, uh, people throw at you, most people throw at you, phenomenological equations for a uh, couple of PDEs for an orientation field Q, a velocity field V, and a density field, the density of these active objects, rho, coupled together. Typically, uh, if you take simplest terms allowed by symmetries uh, and uh, necessary nonlinearities to compensate for instabilities, then you end up with 10 or 15 terms with 10 or 15 arbitrary coefficients. And the challenge, this is moving by itself, wow. Uh, sorry, the challenge is to uh, connect those 10 or 15 coefficients to give them values, to give them even signs that you don't know a priori or you have very little knowledge of it. And so it's essentially disconnected from experiments, and even from microscopic models. So at the level of particle-based models, you actually have very few for what we call the wet case, where you have, you're thinking more of a suspension of active swimmers in some liquid rather than dry uh, system. Okay, anyway, so now I go to the bulk of the talk, which is basically a bacterial system showing active pneumatics. Okay, and I'll show you what I mean by that and show some nice movies and try to make you understand what's going on. Uh, the measurements that uh, these Chinese gentlemen are doing on this is simple measurements of both the pneumatic orientation field and the velocity field. And I'll show you how they measure detailed properties of defects. And after all this, I'll present you a model, which uh, I will convince you, I hope, that it does exactly the same thing, but in a very, very quantitative way. Uh, OK. All right. So the experimental setup is a classic growth of a colony of here, Serasia cells. So they are inoculated. And after 10 or so many hours overnight, there is uh, in this growing colony at the edge of it, on a width of about a few millimeters, typically a very homogeneous, at least on this scale of millimeters, region where it's not quite monolayer cells, very, very densely packed. Um, and, and that is our playground. So, and that thing evolves on, on time scales of, of the order of seconds. So compared to the time scale of the growth of a colony, this is, a, this is very, very fast. So you can consider the colony growth and cell division and all this to be negligible during 
the typical times of the dynamics I'm talking about. And it's just absurd using, you know, using simple, you know, the cells are fluorescent, fluorescently marked and, and simple microscopy. Uh, nothing fancy like in the previous talk uh, is used there. So what is uh, what they do is that they they give the the, the cells are growing in uh, in the, with drug added some some antibiotic which sort of inhibits cell division with and uh, creating depending on the uh, concentration of this drug. Uh, shorter or longer cells than the white type, so to speak. And that's the only thing that they sort of control experimentally. Uh, I have no time to, to discuss much of this uh, because I will spend most of my time speaking about a given experiment realized at a given uh, drug value here, but this is basically what they can change easily uh, other than you know temperature and other things too, of course. Okay, so how, what does it look like? Uh, it looks like this. Here you have a, all cells are marked by fluorescence so, and they're so dense, they're not quite monolayer and so dense that it's actually uh, very hard, even though this image is not very high quality here, uh, it's very hard to impossible to see all cells and certainly to track them. But you do see that locally, like in the microtubules uh, I showed you, you can define an, a local orientation by your eye simply. Okay, this is almost real time, it's actually slower than real time. Um, and the field of view is 300 microns, the cells are about, you know, 10 microns, 20 microns, depending on the distribution of sizes. Okay, and um, I have the, the chat window here annoying me, <laughs> preventing me from reading my slides. So let me get out of the show and try to correct for this. Can I do this? Yes, I can. Okay, I go back to full mode. Sorry for this interruption. Okay, uh, what you can see here, if you have a good eye, is that uh, given the orientation of a given uh, of a cell, if you if you stop on uh, if you start looking at a particular cell, you will see that most of the time it is not moving in the lab frame here along its axis. You know, you don't know head or tail of a cell. Or you don't know where the flagella are, etc. But it's not moving. The cells are not moving in the lab frame um, along their axis, which means that they uh, most of the motion you see here is is dominated, is completely controlled by what you see here is only the advection of the cells by the flow that they create themselves. So you know, they they try to swim. Uh, it's essentially jammed, so they cannot really swim. They cannot move with respect to the fluid, but they do uh, activate the fluid. And because they are aligned, this activation uh, is amplified and producing motion of the flow. That flow moves and rotates the cells, and that's what you're seeing here. Another way of, of saying the same thing is to look at more or less the same movie where only a fraction of the cells have been marked now. So you can see what a given cell is doing. Some of them are moving very fast along their axis, sometimes because they suddenly have space in front of them, but most of them are not moving along their axis. Okay, that will be important in the, in the modeling part later. But really, uh, so what do these uh, Chinese friends do? They, from these sort of movies, uh, a little bit of processing, a little bit of coarse graining, et cetera, they are able to extract local orientation everywhere in space and time. And that's coded here by, you know, if you construct basically a tensor based on the derivatives of this image of this grayscale image uh, from which you extract uh, eigenvectors and, and you can go from there to not only an orientation, but it's intensity also locally. So that's what you see in these colored rods. They are colored by their orientation. Uh, from this orientational field, pneumatic field, you can uh, locate the defects, and these are marked here by these uh, red and blue things. The red ones are the plus ones with their orientation, the blue ones are these triangular uh, symbols here. Okay, here is another sketch of a, what is a plus defect. If you go around the core, the pneumatic orientation will turn only one half turn, whereas you have turned you have turned one circle and around the minus one, it's 
kinematic orientation will turn minus one circle. So that's plus one half and minus one half defects. That's what they're called. And these are again robust quantities in space time. They cannot disappear by themselves. And if you look at the movie, they don't disappear by themselves. They only disappear by meeting another opposite sign defect and they are created by pairs as expected. Okay. They, from the same movies, uh, using usual PIV techniques from or pixel image velocimetry, you can actually uh, extract a velocity field. And now the arrows are, the little rods are arrows. They have a sign and they have an amplitude and, and, and they call it by their orientation, but that's basically the velocity field. Of course, all these measurements involve some coarse graining and the coarse graining is done on a scale which is you know, uh, smaller than the cell length and larger than the cell width. Okay, so now the experiments give you these space time uh, fields, orientation and velocity. And, and from this, we can try to proceed measuring various quantities of interest. Okay, so this is very similar to, to other systems of active pneumatics, in particular to the Dodgic system, you know, in which the microtubules do not swim, they, they actually. Uh, form a fluid that is uh, moving and rotating, okay? So here, the main effect of uh, having more drug in the system, having longer cells, is that everything gets, amp gets zoomed out. I mean, you have at low drug levels, you have uh, short correlation lengths and many defects. At higher drug level, you have longer correlation lengths and fewer defects. In fact, you can measure these things. You can measure correlation length, two point correlation. So in space on the X axis and these correlations here on the Y axis normalized to be one at zero. Uh, you cut at some arbitrary level here to define a correlation length. Using this defined correlation length, you can rescale reasonably well all experiments worked out at various drug levels colored by the, uh, the drug level is, is in the color here. And you can do this on the velocity on the pneumatic field here. You can do this on the velocity field here, and both can be rescaled. Uh, so here you have a correlation length for the velocity field, the correlation length for the pneumatic field. You can do correlation times of the pneumatic field, correlation times of the pneumatic field. You can also do from defects, typical interdistance between defects that's defined, that defines you another correlation length. All of these correlation lengths are one to one. So are all experiments here. Here you have the velocity correlation length and the pneumatic correlation length on the Y axis and they go on one to one with the, you know, of course, given that they are more or less of the same order always. And the third length that you would like to dis Define uh, related to typical defect interdistance is also one to one with the others. So basically, you have one lens scale in the system, and your main control knob experimentally tunes this lens scale more or less systematically. There's lots of variations, of course. Now, uh, this is very rough log, you know, characterization of what's going on, and and I want to focus on the defects. Not so much because I believe uh, this system can be described as a gas of defects, which is uh, probably not the case in this in this for this system. But because because defects are, are useful markers of this chaotic dynamics, you know, my experiments provides me with chaotic dynamics. I want I want to build a model that accounts faithfully for it, and that's all I have. I have this space time chaos, and so the defects are interesting because they are special points and they force the field to visit the orientational field to visit zero because the field is not defined at, at the defect core. That's useful from the modeling viewpoint, as I will argue in the following. Okay, so what do we do on these defects? So we measure them not right after their birth and not just before they die. So, you know, these are, uh, depending on how much space time you have, uh, you, you get more or less data. Uh, and we measure various things. On the first column, you have the G of R uh, function, which typically gives you the typical correlation between defects of the same type here, two plus one half defects on, on the top. And you see the G of R is basically flat, except for this uh, thing here, which gives you a basic lens curve of defect core. Same thing happens for minus minus defects. And when you have a plus and a minus, you have this bump here, which means that you have some interactions between them at, at this distance also. That's not so important for this talk. 
uh, on this column, you have defect velocities. You have a defect uh, speed. Speed. You have a speed of a plus defect in the lab frame. So that's what the speed of the red symbols that you saw on, on the orientational field movie. And you see that it is distributed. It's a PDF of it and has a mean, which is pretty large, actually 100 microns per second here. Whereas the minus defect is also moving in the lab frame and has a typical speed of, you know, I don't know, 30 microns per second. She's not so small, but you also have um, here the speed of the plus defect in the fluid frame. So you, you, we measure the velocity field. So at the location of a defect and its core, we, we do know what's the fluid flow. If you subtract that velocity and measure uh, the, the defect velocity uh, or speed here, in this frame, in this moving frame, the fluid frame, you do record a non-zero significant speed for the plus defect. So even in the fluid frame, the defect is moving, usually moving uh, along the fluid flow, actually. Uh, at a speed which is now you know, the order of 50 maybe, which is half of what it was here, it's not negligible. And the real surprise is that we do believe that for the minus defect, which is not usually not presented as a polar object, but if you, out of its three branches, if you choose the one that is closest to the velocity of the fluid flow below it, you see that in this frame of a fluid, the minus defect also has a significantly non-zero speed. Ah. Sorry to interrupt, just a three minute warning. Yes, okay. So, and then you have uh, statistics on orientations. I'll speed up considerably now. Uh, we look now, this slide is about measurements obtained on many, many defects, following them in space and time in their frame of reference. And so that the spatial structure is uh, represented here in colors and orientation. So that's the velocity field around a plus defect, the velocity field around a minus defect. On the left, you have the orientation fields. And what you have in the panels below is recording the uh, recording of how the orientational field is moving for a plus defect. I told you to go around the circle, it will turn by pi. Sorry, let me go back. Uh, that's why it's plus one half defect. But the way it does this is not linearly. You know, if I if I go around this, the defect core regularly here, the angular uh, orientation of the pneumatic field is not going to turn linearly uh, with this uh, reference uh, circle that I'm drawing here. What you see here is, for example, the deviation from the linear variation of uh, the defect director as you move around the defect. And this is a signature of important quantities in the, in the theory of continuous theory of pneumatics. I don't have time to go into this. You can do this for a plus defect or a minus defect or the velocity field. You can also do things like that. And these are very, very fine uh, properties of a structure, space structure, spatial structure of defects. Okay. Now, uh, the modeling uh, very fast. Uh, these are objects evolving in a Stokes fluid. You can neglect inertia, uh, as most of you probably know. This is a Stokes equation, which is forced by the pneumatic field here, Q. Okay, this has three parameters here. Two of them are independent, plus an incompressibility condition that I have here. But two independent parameters, an effective driving strength, an effective hydrodynamic screening length here. Okay, what do we, what do, we do first? Uh, we, we have we have a, an experimental um, Q field, orientation field. At the same time, we can have an orientation field and a velocity field. We take the experimental Q field, okay? We solve, we solve uh, given this Q field, we solve for the velocity field satisfying the Stokes equation. We find the V field. So that's an experimental, this is a velocity field deducted from the Q field. And we compare this field to the experimentally measured velocity field. So we have one which is deducted from the Q field. We compare to the experimentally measured velocity field. Okay. Uh, and we match, we tune these two parameters, two independent parameters that I flashed at you so that the matching is optimal. And, th and there is a one and unique point where the matching is optimal. Whether you do this on a single time or over time, it's always true. 
And, and so these are optimal parameters, which we deem to be uh, representing uh, how our Stokes fluid is excited and screened uh, this friction in the new system. Then we build, we propose this model, which uh, is an effective um, model describing effective alignment on the scale of cell length, say. So this is a term for, these are particles now, which are embedded in this Stokes fluid. They move because they're advected by the fluid. They don't move by themselves in the fluid frame because as I told you, they cannot do it. There's a bit of repulsion between particles that's not so important. Uh, and the orientation of these particles, they carry an emetic degree of freedom. It, they align with their neighbors, again, on a scale corresponding to cell length. And they are rotated by uh, vorticity and, and strain like they should do in the fluid. Okay, and there's a bit of noise about it. And that's the fluid part you just showed before. Okay, excited by this Q field here. So now this model has, if you take reasonable parameter values, it does have a, more or less the right thing. You can do it on very, very large scales. You can have the same number of particles that you have in cells in your field of view, at least easily. Uh, but the problem is that we have now six new parameters in addition to the fluid ones. And we would like to show, find a way to determine these six parameters from data. So I'm going to skip that part. Uh, it's not so hard. We did it in a sort of very pedestrian manner, but it works. And at the end, for every experiment we can look at, we have a single optimal set of parameters, uh, which does the job of matching. We, we do this by matching essentially three, three of the global quantities I showed you before, the mean speed of plus and minus defects. And uh, I'm not even remembering what else, the correlation length, one correlation length, okay? So we, we, we find this optimal parameters by matching uh, free global quantities and all the others actually match. So here, I didn't tell you, but you have blue and green curves, blue and red curves, sorry. Uh, and I never remember, I think the red is experimental and the blue is the model, okay? So, and so everything matches. And if you remember what these quantities are, this is true even for this very delicate point here, whether the minus defect has an intrinsic speed. Uh, and for the defect, um, structure, uh, the same is true here. It's uh, the continuous lines are the experimental lines and the dashed lines are from the model. So from fitting three global quantities, we get all these fine details fairly well or even very well reproduced in this model. Okay, um, it's a summary here. We can uh, find uh, easily uh, actinomatics in bacteria. In fact, as long as you have dense suspensions with long enough cells, you they will, and they're trying to swim, they're not dead, of course, you, you'll get some active pneumatics. Um, here, by uh, you know, measuring things, both velocity and orientation, we get interesting features for what the defects are doing and things like that. We can do quantitative modeling, okay? And it's not just for the theory satisfaction. You know, I'm very happy of this matching here, that's good for me, but, um, uh, now you can translate what you can control in experiments to paths in the parameter space of this model, okay, and see what does what and, 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 and interpret uh, what you do experimentally in terms of these mechanistic interactions and what they mean, etc. The next step, of course, which we, we are doing is to derive hydrodynamic equations from this particular uh, particle in a fluid model, okay. And this is bound to give the usual terms, but maybe some others. And certainly we will have connection between the hydrodynamic level theories, continuous theories, and the microscopic level parameters, which have been, you know, which have been quantified, uh, linked themselves to the experimental control knobs. So we, when we do this, when we finish this, we have all the way uh, a connection from the experiments uh, to the, uh, many, many transport coefficients of the hydrodynamic theories that we have here. Okay, I'll stop here. If you want to read about this, this has been published actually two years ago and you can read this very nice paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have time for, for one question before we do the informal chat. So thank you very much for that talk. And let's see, I will choose a question um, from the chat here. 
So how do the boundaries affect the behavior of this system? Well, for the, for the experiment, uh, what you have seen here is a 300 micron field of view out of something that happens over minimum of one millimeter, often two or three millimeters. So we like to think that the boundaries do not matter for, for the experimental data. This field of view of 300 micrometers is a good compromise between uh, for extracting uh, safely uh, the velocity and orientation fields. We could have a larger field of view, but then, you know, so. Now for the model, um, what we do is that we actually run uh, uh, a much larger system and we also look at part of it. We do exactly, we follow the same procedure. We do the same coarse graining as the experiment. And so we put boundaries very, very far away. And, uh, and these are periodic boundary conditions, numerically easier, uh, much easier here because it allows you to solve the Stokes equation directly without actually simulating it. Uh, so there's lots of advantages of doing this. And again, this is such a simple model, uh, accounting effectively for everything at the cell's body lamp scale by a few interaction terms. We don't want to detail any of the, of the very fine grained uh, things that are going on in between cells, et cetera. And because that would be not very uh, versatile. So we have this versatile model and because it's so simple, we can easily simulate millions of swimmers, so to speak, here, yeah. yeah. 